With the likes of Metal Gear Solid and Siphon Filter, the PlayStation was the home of the action adventure. As you would expect, this resulted in a ton of similar games that would flood the system. Not all of them would find the same success, with many of them falling into obscurity. One of these games was Chase the Express, which all revolves around the Blue Harvest, an advanced military train en route to Paris. Of course, it's not long before everything goes wrong, with a group of terrorists occupying the train and taking some of the high-level personnel on board captive. This is where the player comes in and takes up the role of one Jack Morton, the sole survivor of the team on board. When it comes to gameplay, however, this is where some might struggle due to the tank control setup, which is bound to put some people off. For me personally, I've never had an issue with them and found that controlling Jack was really responsive. A certain level of worry is added to the action as it takes some time to react, which really ramps up the tension of each encounter. And there's plenty of enemies you'll be running into as well. The game constantly deals out new ways to tackle each threat, from standard pistols to the more devastating machine guns and grenades. Visually, Chase the Express is hands down one of the most impressive games on the PlayStation 1. For a start, the character models possess an extreme amount of detail that you wouldn't normally find in a game of this type on the PS1. Sure, the backgrounds are pre-rendered, but the approach they took saw the team actually mapping and layering them onto simple 3D geometry to allow the game to use a dynamic camera. This effect is simply stunning in motion and adds a real cinematic quality to the events that play out. If you're looking to jump into an exhilarating and rewarding game on the PS1, Chase the Express ticks all of the boxes. After sneaking up on players back in 1998, Tenchu went on to become one of the most prominent games on the PlayStation, and it wasn't too long until we saw a sequel. There were a host of new features in Tenchu 2, including the ability to swim underwater, breathing through a bamboo snorkel while remaining out of sight below the surface, dragging and searching dead bodies for items, as well as a host of new combat moves. But if you ever played the first Tenchu for yourself, then the first thing you'll notice with the sequel is just how much faster and more fluid the character movements were. It made the game's central mechanic of sneaking behind enemies and killing them all the more fun, and even improved the first game's wonky combat. It felt like a real step up over the original, and this is no more apparent than when it comes to presentation. The graphics in Tenchu 2 are very well designed for the most part, and are pleasing to the eyes. The landscapes throughout the various missions include mountains, islands, jungles, and villages, and most notably include daytime missions, as well as the trademark nighttime environments. The background is lush with details, and the enemies are very well rendered, animated and varied, and although it might be quite crude by today's standard, there's no denying how good it looked all of those years ago. Sadly, the camera does let the overall gameplay down though. At times you'll find yourself fighting with it just as much as you do the enemies, but this is something that can easily be overlooked. If you're considering buying this game, then I say go right ahead, because you will certainly not be disappointed. From Gradius to R-Type and Raiden, shooters were a dime a dozen on the PlayStation 1, but when it comes to the best looking, it would have to be raised on. It saw you stepping into the shoes of a hotshot pilot as you attempt to protect the Earth from an invading force. You get to choose from one of two ships that each have their own distinct advantages and cons, such as one being faster or the other offering up more damage potential. When it comes to gameplay, the single most important aspect of any shooter, or almost any game for that matter, is control. Raced on, thankfully delivered and making your way through it never feels like a chore. Everything is tight and responsive. And trust me, to reach the end you'll need to have a full understanding of all the mechanics in play. As you would expect, there's a ton of weapons that can be picked up throughout each run, from your standard lasers to more explosive options like electrical bolts that can destroy up to 16 targets at once. Like most shooters, you can expect a range of power-ups as well that are presented in the form of diamonds which slowly add more and more power to one of your weapons. It's a great system that really comes into play when taking on one of the several boss encounters that make up the game. Now getting into the visuals, once you make it out of the Earth's atmosphere and into the heart of the invading fleet, you'll be in for a true visual treat. Incredible animation and a range of special effects fill the screen in neon colours as you tear down enemy after enemy, and this is what gives Ray Storm the extra shine it needs. As with most polygon heavy games, there is a bit of slowdown when the action heats up, but it never gets out of hand. Overall, Ray Storm is one hell of a shooter on the PlayStation 1. If you're a fan of the genre, do not pass this one up. 
When you think of first-person shooters, the PlayStation is probably not the first console that comes to mind. Sure, there were several experiences that proved the genre was viable on the system, but none that never made that much of a splash. One of these was Delta Force Urban Warfare that saw the player taking on the role of John Carter, an operative, part of a four-man team who sent in to deal with some rather suspect arm dealers. To be fair, the story is surprisingly good, so I won't go into too much detail. Sadly though, if there's one area that lets the game down, it has to be a gameplay. The controls will take a bit of time to get used to, especially considering that Rebellion got confused when thinking the PlayStation controller had as many buttons as a keyboard. Many actions have to be performed by pressing two buttons at the same time, which is just a pain in the ass, considering that tasks such as reloading and crouching fall under these particular types. However, after a while, you'll get used to it. But what really helps Delta Force stand out is just how well the game is aged. For a PlayStation 1 game, it's nothing short of incredible. Sure, the environments are a bit jaggy and the textures could have done with a bit of work, but it's the character and weapon models themselves that really shine. There's an amazing level of detail on show, even down to the way characters' mouths actually move when they talk. Unfortunately, all of this does come at a cost and the frame rate can be prone to dipping well below its target, but it doesn't completely ruin the overall experience as it doesn't happen all of the time. If you fancy taking on a PlayStation one first person shooter, Delta Force Urban Warfare would make for a great option. Threads of Fate, known as Jude Prism in Japan, is a somewhat unknown and hard to find action RPG made by Squaresoft. The story follows the adventures of Mint and Rue, who each have their own goals within the world. Mint is hell-bent on world domination, whereas Rue is simply searching for those responsible for his friend's death. The first of many unique things you'll notice about the game is that in fact it's two games in one. When you start out, you're given the option of using either character, with their adventures taking them in completely different directions. When when it comes to gameplay, its battle system is very friendly to new players, and it's in real time. There are no random battles, as the monsters just appear in the areas you are going through, allowing the player to avoid confrontations at will. When you do enter battle, however, Mint and Rue both have different special abilities. Rue can transform into monsters you have recently fought, with Mint on the other hand using her hoop-like weapons to cast magic. This opens up a ton of options when it comes to taking out enemies, and by far is one of the most enjoyable aspects of the game. To this day, it still kinda puzzles me how the old PlayStation handled the visual beauty of this game. It's just incredible. It runs at a resolution much higher than a lot of games that released on the system, and uses a colour palette of a few hundred colours, yet somehow it never misses the mark or drops a beat during play. The characters are so vibrantly detailed with their own animations that not only show a high degree of realism, but their own distinctive personalities as well. Environments receive the same level of attention, with the more being large and grandiose, but more importantly unique. You're not going to be running through the world and finding the same things twice. It's clearly a lot of work went into making the world feel like a believable space, which only helps elevate the entire experience. Vanark is a shooter and a great one at that. There may not be much strategy involved, but flying through levels at breakneck speed while blowing everything up that moves is pretty fun. There's a generous amount of ways to do this, with several weapons and power-ups that make it all the more engaging. In between stages, your character gets to run about the transport ship that you're on, courtesy of a third-person Resident Evil-style control scheme, but don't expect too much from this, with the exception of walking in on one of the female characters while she's in the shower and a brief maze sequence that affects one of the levels played. These sections are quite weak, and it's a bit of a shame to be honest, as this is where a lot of the more intriguing aspects of the world bit on created reside. It would have been nice to see this part of the game expanded, but we can't have it all. But Vanak's strong points are its dynamic on-rails action over and through some really amazing 3D levels. There are multiple paths, and you'll always feel as if you've missed something after each level ends, and this is where the replayability factor comes into play. You'll You'll streak over and through raging, monster-filled seas, flaming caverns, and deep space, each packed with cinematic camera angles and incredible effects that light up the screen. In the end, Vanak is a really well-done, fast-paced, and involving shooter that didn't break any new ground. 
When it came to racing on the PS1, the console soon found itself being the place to be with heavy hitters like Ridge Racer and Gran Turismo. Another racing series also got its start on the console though, and that was the Colin McRae Rally Games, which is still going strong to this day with its spiritual successor Dirt. Now the game's primary focus is the Championship Rally, which spans an impressive eight countries with nearly 90 different tracks. Colin McRae Rally 2 is a huge, grueling race that seems to just go on forever but I'm not complaining. Probably the best thing about it is the massive addition of cars. You start out with about 6 of them and can earn about 10 more as you complete the rally and arcade modes. All of the cars manage to feel different once out on the track. Of course you can fully tweak your vehicle as well with various options such as engines, suspension and exhaust that further alters their performance. Getting to grips with this system early on is a good idea as each track will affect your car differently as well. May that be its terrain or even weather conditions which all have a role to play in each race. A whole new game deserves a whole new look, and Colin McRae Rally 2 delivered. The game is a joy to behold. It's amazing what capable developers were able to squeeze out of the PlayStation, with the game running smoothly and the frame rate staying consistent. The cars themselves are equally impressive and are cut above the rest, with a lot more detail being poured into them. When it comes to Rally on the PlayStation 1, Colin McRae 2 is the gold standard. If you never played it back in the day, it's still well worth picking up. The first Tomb Raider hit the PlayStation way back in 1996, which introduced everyone to Lara Croft, a rather charming young woman with a fondness of tight leather. Fast forward a few years and several sequels later, the series was starting to decline, and the fourth entry felt like one last crack at capturing what made the early games so great. Setting the adventure entirely in Egypt was a wise move, as it brought back the claustrophobic feel that everyone loved from the first game. A lot of the levels in Tomb Raider 2 and 3 were set out in the open air, and although it was a nice refreshing touch at the time, it didn't take people too long to realise they actually preferred the idea of being closed in, as it gave the game a creepy atmosphere. As far as gameplay goes, it retains much from its predecessors, but sees Lara learning a few new tricks that help the player get around. An assortment of weapons become available as you progress as well, which open up many new strategies when it comes to dealing with enemies. But the biggest improvement were the graphics themselves, and were some of the best seen on the PlayStation, and really push the console to its limits. The lighting effects are fantastic, and even the small things such as water dripping off Lara when she's wet, or the footprints she leaves in the sand make a huge difference. The labyrinths you explore are sprawling in scope, with plenty of variety, from the shanty towns that surround the city to the pyramids themselves. The game constantly surprises. The only flaw I found is the camera if I'm being honest. At times it can be a bit unwieldy and hamper the gameplay. Thankfully it's not a deal breaker, but something definitely worth mentioning if you're going to play it. In the end, Tomb Raider The Last Revelation was a real return to form for the series, and going back to its roots, paid off by the bucket load. It was once thought that it would be impossible to port even the first Quake game to the PlayStation 1, but Hammerhead smashed expectations and instead brought the superior sequel to the home console instead, with near little to no compromise. For those that have never played it, Quake is a first person shooter which puts you into the boots of an unnamed grunt as you take down wave after wave of enemies with a surprisingly diverse set of weaponry. The game provides many backdrops to these battles, fights involving grenades and rockets can prove disastrous in these corner filled mazes, while the dreaded railgun is fantastic for sniping across the entire level. It provides many different approaches for the player to take, but Quake 2 always knows what kind of enemy will cause the worst problems for the player. It exploits this aspect well, and will manage to keep you on your toes as you make your way through it, as well as the player having a tremendous arsenal. It also arms the enemies with the same weapons, and they tend to get each new weapon ahead of you, a scheme which helps to maintain the steady difficulty curve. After you've survived nearly 20 levels of increasingly rigorous treatment, there's a boss that serves as the icing on the cake. Now for a PlayStation game, Quake 2 is nothing short of a technical marvel, running at a consistent and smooth frame rate at almost all times. Of course, everything was dialed back a bit when compared to the PC version, but only the keen eyed will notice. The textures may look a little washed out, a few models may have been simplified, and a few frames of animations may have been chopped here and there, but overall the game runs at a very very playable speed. If you're on the lookout for some first person action on the PlayStation 1, Quake 2 has got it all. 
Now for me, personally, Legend of Mana isn't actually one of the greatest examples of a solid RPG. The game has many flaws, but one aspect that cannot be denied is just how downright impressive the visuals are. Now like most RPGs, Legend of Mana all revolves around taking on a series of quests, which most of the time involve a trip through a monster infested dungeon or land, gathering the right information from the townspeople, or solving some sort of puzzle. You can even take on multiple quests at one time, thanks to a handy little journal that helps the player keep track of their progress. Combat takes place in real time, but you can't just run up to an enemy and bop him on the head. If you're spotted, the game transports you into a sort of invisible arena where you must then take out anything that moves. Naturally, you've got several weapons and abilities at your disposal, which can be assigned to the face buttons for quick access. Now the visuals in Legend of Mana are very well done, with most of it being presented in a sort of hand-drawn watercolour style. And the final result is beautiful. Every background is like a painting and it feels as if you're journeying through a living storybook. Subtle sunlight effects bathe the outdoor areas, giving them a presence and life that static backgrounds rarely have. Sure, human characters are far from the norm in Legend of Mana, and everyone from chubby rabbit-like merchants to Catwoman warriors are all visualised with the same vivid colour and detail as the backgrounds, especially their dialogue portraits. The sprite movements are all fluid, from your own character and NPCs to the massive and equally grand bosses. When it comes to 2D games on the PlayStation 1, you'll be hard pressed finding something that looks better than this. Well that does it for today's video, keep an eye out for part 4 as that will be coming up soon, so don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell to get notified about new videos. You can follow me on all of the socials to stay up to date and also join my growing community on Discord to meet many like minded gamers to continue the conversation with. I'd like to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters as well, Rhino, Skill Jim, Nano, Steve, Richard, Amy, Daniel, Paul, Quinn, Dio, Alex, Pierre, Carl, Strider and Paddy J for their continued support that helps make these videos possible. If you're interested in joining my Discord or supporting the channel through Patreon, to gain access to exclusive videos, monthly Q&As and giveaways for as little as $1 per month, you'll find the links in the description. As always, thanks for taking the time to watch the video, I'll catch you next time.